Golden Spiral Media presents The Blacklist Exposed. Season two of The Blacklist is here. The team is back together and the red one-liners are back with a vengeance. Welcome to The Blacklist Exposed. I am Agent Troy Heinrichs. And I'm Agent Aaron Peterson, and I am psyched to finally talk about Red and Dembe, the Riggs and Murtaugh of 2014. And we are going to discuss number 104 on The Blacklist, Lord Baltimore, tonight, which aired on September 22nd, 2014. Show notes and other intel on this episode for The Blacklist Exposed can be found at goldenspiralmedia.com forward slash The Blacklist. Well, after weeks of anticipation, we have finally seen the season two premiere. So before we get into the details of this week's episode, what did you think overall of how things went down last night, Mr. Peterson? I loved the opening. The opening, I thought, was fantastic. It it was a great reintroduction to the character. Made you remember why Red is the coolest character on television currently. The thing that we have to remember as we watch The Blacklist, is that cigars and alcohol never go well together, whether it's season one or season two. Well, why did he burn the money <laughs> after it was all said and done? That was kind of a ha-ha. He didn't need to do that. Why did he burn it? Ah, just to piss him off just because he could. It wasn't his money. What did he care? Wow. That was a cold move. You know why I like this introduction is, is because I think last season he wasn't much of a doer. He got things done, but it was more through playing chess, manipulating events and and people. This time, I mean, he was there and getting it done. He was in the thick of the action, causing death and destruction. It's just, I like that introduction to show you exactly how how much of a badass Red really is. Yeah, and it really harkens back to when he was on that mole hunt at the middle half of season one, how much action he took. And this, I think, really puts him into the forefront to set up a completely different paradigm for season two since he was kind of working through Liz and feeding her intel. And now he's the one that's actually on the front line being chased, being harassed by Berlin himself and the five hitmen that apparently Berlin has set out against him. Now, let me ask you, because we're going to get into the details. We're going to talk about all all the minute details that we that we can. But what did you think for, in terms of setting up season two, did this episode do everything you think it needed to do? Was it lacking in any areas right off the top of your head? Overall episode was, I would say, 90% what I expected. The 10% that faltered was this kind of reintroduction of the task force. I mean, we never really got to learn about this FBI agent, and I still don't even know his name off the top of my head. I didn't even write it down because he's just, Seems so kind of a background character, but he was kind of harassing Harold after Diane Fowler went down. So now he's in charge while Harold's out of the picture. And then they introduce the assistant deputy attorney general or whatever her name was. And I think that whole part just seemed a little bit off or weird to me. That seemed weird or off. Okay, that's fair. Well, so that was the 10% you think uh, that could have been done a little better. Yeah, just give us a kind of backstory of what happened when Harold went into the hospital why this guy took over, why she's involved now that Diane Fowler is out of the picture and just a little more there. Otherwise, don't show him at all and just have the task force be up and running. I got you. I I see what you're saying. Overall, I I was very actually impressed because I was concerned that there was going to be a little bit of a dip. Sometimes when you get that sophomore season, that's kind of when you tell if a series is going to take that next step to be a great series versus it's either going to regress or it's just going to plateau. I think Blacklist did enough to where it took a step forward, kept things in motion, keeps you interested in the the several dangling plot lines, and added just enough mystery to really keep you coming back week after week. That that was very well done, in my opinion. Well, I know we had our profiling question last week about the things, the big questions that people wanted answered. Mm -hmm. And we threw that out there, Facebook, Twitter, all the normal places. Did we get any responses back on what other people thought they might be wanting out of season two we did uh aaron not me spelled e-r-i-n so i'm assuming she's a female otherwise she got the the better the better spelling she says if they answer the big question the series will be over that's pretty accurate i I really don't think they're going to answer the big question anytime soon what do you think the big question is well the big question i think is what's the connection to keen I mean, yes, some people would say that the overall, what is the end game that Rudd keeps talking about? What is that end game? 
you know, the war that's coming, whatever. That's actually for me, not the big question. I really just want to know what, how keen figures into everything. You, what happens when she doesn't figure into anything and she's just a complete pawn in the entire game. Well, then I'm going to feel stupid because I wasted a whole lot of time for nothing. (laughs) What's, what's the big question for you then? I think the big question is more, why did red turn criminal in the first place? Was it specifically to revenge his family's death if, in fact, his family is dead, since we now meet Mrs. Reddington, former Mrs. Reddington, in this episode this evening? So for me, I think it's, it's why. Why throw away the Navy career to go into this life of criminal if there isn't some bigger play out there? That's the bigger story that I'm interested in. Okay. Well, also, Jody said they won't answer anything. They will just give us more questions. So suddenly it's lost, Jody? Is that what you think? I hope that's not the case. I, I think we're going to get more answers as the series goes. But you're right. Every time they answer something, just like any other series, they're going to have to ask more questions. Summer still wants to know who Lizzie belongs to. What do you mean belongs to, I guess? I'm assuming she means the father-daughter relationship question from season one. Mm, I'm starting to lend credence to your theory that it might be um, Berlin's daughter. And we have a really great profiling question for next week as well. You'll have to stay tuned until later in the episode, though, to hear what that question may be, as we have some really interesting theories on what might be happening towards the end of the episode. Neftali, I hope I said that right, wonders, is Red's ex-wife Lizzie's mom, but Red is not necessarily the father. Tramp. Um, that's, a, that's a very good, that's a good theory. I think that's definitely a possibility. Not quite sure. How that figures in. I definitely think it's Red or Berlin is her dad. You? Yeah, I'm I said from the get go that Lizzie was Berlin's daughter, and I think that they were just messing with Berlin. I don't know if they were messing with Berlin or if they were messing with Red through Berlin, but I think that's what we'll have to see how it plays out as these first eight go through their cycle. I'm really thinking these first eight are gonna be more Berlin focused than whatever this war is between the two of them. Because if you remember back at the end of season one, he's still like, I don't understand what the heck I did to you because I don't know who you are. Mm -hmm. So was that a true statement? Does he really not know Berlin? Or did he say that in reference to the guy who was the fake Berlin specifically because he didn't recognize him? Very good. We'll find out. It's all it's all going to come to fruition at some point. Selena wants to know where Red got his scars. I do, too. I really want to know where where he got his scars. I know it's from a fire of some sort, but which one, what happened, everything else that happened, exactly what happened in that fire. Yeah, and every time they introduce a new thing, this uh, in this episode specifically, they introduced the thing that happened uh, with the Mossad agent in that situation, and then they, of course, go back to the Kuwait incident again. So he could have gotten burned anywhere. He mm-hmm. could have just been on the line of fire in a standard war or a standard skirmish and gotten blasted by a, a bomb and just had some fire come up his back. You know, they just throw it in there and you assume that it's going to be something about saving Liz's life, but it could be a hundred of other things because of all these mini stories that they drop in. It could be. It, time will tell. Time will tell. Well, if you want to answer the profiling question of the week, there's a couple ways you can do that. You can comment on our Facebook group. That's at facebook.com slash groups slash the blacklist GSM. Or of course, you can tweet back at us on Twitter. Our handle is at the blacklist GSM, or of course, visit the feedback section over at goldenspiralmedia.com slash the blacklist. And now we'll break it down with this week's episode case profile. I kind of feel like I should do a little uh, music. Whenever you say break it down, I automatically get 80s rap reflections. Sorry. (laughs) Uh, let's start with the main case this week, and then we'll kind of look at each character and what, what happened during the episode. What we try not to do is I know some podcasts will go through and they'll, they will basically retask themselves with covering every step of the episode. We're going to try to cover the episode in full without having to do every minute detail, which I hope is more interesting for you guys. Let us know what you think. Lord Baltimore, that is the focal point of this episode It's essentially a data miner who's been hired to find someone. Now, we don't find out who that someone is until the end of the episode. We'll get there. But how did you feel about using somewhat of a real NSA concern as the focal point for the episode? I really love it when TV shows actually prey, if you will, on the fears (laughs) of what people are dealing with today. I mean, I wouldn't be shocked to see a potential ISIS play 
sometime this season on Ooh, the blacklist. I like that. But this is a big concern across the board, right? It's, oh, Google's doing this, and Facebook Messenger is like listening to every conversation I have, and Cortana, and hey, Google, and hey, Siri, and all this jazz. And all this data is just flowing out there. So who does know exactly everything about you? And if you can take all of that data and basically group it into a big data warehouse and then use that information to exploit things out of people, I mean, that is a true concern that people have out there. Could it happen? Sure. Credit cards are getting hacked. Sure. Things are going to be out there. Apple now just released their health kit app where they're aggregating all of this health data. It could go to your insurance company or whatever. So the real question is, is do you live in fear, like Red, or do you live in the open, like Liz, and then you risk potentially having someone track you down? That's an interesting way to look at it. I, I just like that they introduce it. Uh, Red immediately alludes to the fact that we're stupid because you people are <laughs> putting all your personal information into this international giant storage box that anybody can crack into. And I really like that they use this out of the gate. It's been a long time discussed topic in the news and politics. And it's nice that they're, like you said, kind of bringing real real time issues to the uh, fictional storylines. And that really worked. Now, what about Krista Ritter as the uh, dual personality, Nora slash Rowan? I thought this was probably the most ingenious play because I totally did not see it coming. Wait, wait, wait. Which, which part didn't you see coming? I didn't see the twist. The fact that it was one in the same person. That just totally blew my mind. Because when it happened, I was like, oh, that's so awesome. I can't believe that they actually pulled that off and kept me in the dark this long. How did you think it was going to play out while it was before you knew what was going on? I thought that there was potentially a twin sister. And we'd see her actually playing both characters. In which cases would actually happen. But at the same time... It was more of this cool hypnosis thing. What I really liked is that I didn't see coming at all that it wasn't a kind of Berlin play. I thought at first it might have been a way that they could do like a new super weapon, a superhuman power, if you will, where they could program soldiers. And really, she just had a complete mental break when she killed her sister. Mm. I, okay. <laughs> Maybe it's because I've seen way too many TV shows. That distinctly... That's distinctly possible. But as soon as they said twin sister, I'm like, all right, she's the killer. I, I, <laughs> I didn't even flinch. I think that that's probably because I watch too much TV, but that's ex immediately what went in my head. And my whole thought was if there actually was a twin sister, she's dead. And, you know, it ended up being the case. Well, I assumed she was the killer. I assumed that she was the bad girl playing the good girl's image, if you will. But I never saw the twist that it was the same person. That, I think, was the thing that was cool about this episode. Oh, you thought she was pretending to be right, the, like a, the like, good a, like a trading places, like gotcha. an orphan black kind of situation. Gotcha. Where you're just acting as the other person, not actually both people. See, now here's where you're not going to, you're going to, you're probably just going to lose faith in me completely. I've never seen orphan black, so that reference is lost on me. Lots of people have, and you should. It's awesome. <laughs> I know. That's what people keep telling me. There's only so many shows. Uh, but I did like it. I, I did think that they had a nice play on that twist because they did use psychology and even brought Keen's. Did you like the little nod that she had to mention how she has a psychology degree in the car? <laughs> like, well, you got to remember, that's why she was hired in the first place. She's a criminal profiler. She has this psychological background. And so you kind of have to reintroduce that, I suppose, to the audience, especially if people are coming on fresh for this season. Absolutely. I, I, I liked the little nod. I mean, I thought it was... Subtle enough to where it's a, it's a nice reintroduction of, of that aspect, but also the point that she said it, all that made me do is go, yep, okay. Now, I, I kind of saw where they were going, and I thought they, they'd work, they worked it out really well. And I think that that aspect could have been very cheesy because you know that the twin sister or twin brother angle has been done quite a bit in television, but I think they handled it pretty well, pretty strong. And her performance, I got to say, Krista Ritter, I think, did a great job. Just snapping like that, flipping gears. Loved it. Yeah, I mean, she's done great things on Veronica Mars. She did uh, be in, uh, Don't Trust the Bee in uh, Apartment 23, I think it was. She was also in um, oh, Breaking Bad. So, I mean, she's, she's a well-rounded actress. And to be able to come into this role 
and actually play two characters this evening. Props to her. I mean, that's a that almost might be a supporting actress guest appearance Emmy nod for her. She did a really great job tonight. She did. And when uh, was his name? Marcus, I think was his name. Was was playing the record, and you know, obviously that was her trigger, and she just snapped. And there's that little that little skitter in her in her head and in her inflection. I thought that was very well done. I was very impressed with that because there are a lot of ways for an actor to do that wrong. And nine times out of ten, when I've seen things like this, they are done kind of poorly, or it's a little too overly dramatic. And I thought she she did it very subtly, and I really appreciated that. What about the ring on her finger? That was the one thing that I kind of kept going to in this episode. She kept kind of twirling that ring around. Was that a kind of her subconscious playing with that ring because that ring belonged to her sister? What do you think about that ring? I really hadn't thought about the ring until you mentioned it. I I assumed it was just a little tick that she added for herself. Was her sister married? The one that she killed? It looked like her sister was pretty young when they found her in the back of the van. Well, I don't know where she's from. Maybe she's from the South. Um, I don't, I don't know. I, I really didn't give it much thought. Because it kept focusing on it. And anytime you like focus on something during the course of the episode, it has to be like a, a component of what's going to come next. And I thought at first then that the ring was actually the trigger versus the song. And that's something like she takes the ring off and then she becomes the other person because she kept just twirling it and they kept focusing on it. And I was like, what is that about? Is it like a transmitter? Is it a radio device? She's keeping in contact with Berlin through it. Like, what's going on? Hmm. It's like her kryptonite. She takes the ring off. She's crazy. She puts it back on. She's normal again. I really didn't think that. Maybe the, the director just had an obsession with uh, rings and fingers. I mean, obviously, that kept coming into play. That hint, is true. Hint, hint. Well, you want to move on to wrestler since we're talking about psychology? His character was pretty much on the edge the entire episode. I really felt like you. they alluded several times to he needed to seek help. And obviously he doesn't. He doesn't think he does. But you see him popping pills. How did you feel about his character development throughout the episode? I thought it was actually quite normal. And yeah, granted, most cops are going to be evasive with the psychology route. And I don't need to talk to you to tell you about my job. And he has that really great speech, too. He's like, you know, I'm doing my job. And yes, it affects me. And when I basically can't get up to work in the morning and feel a concern, then I'll come talk to you. And then, of course, we cut right to that shot where he's at home popping pills and you're like, oh, okay, this is going to become a major plot point for the course of the season. The real question is, is how deep does this psychologist go? And does she dig in further, including Keen and some other people, Aram, if you will? And does she play an important role as the season plays out? I, I, I actually thought he was just on the edge the whole episode. I, I, I got that vibe that, yes, he was very strong and strong-willed when he was talking to his cohorts. He, you know, he's talking to Keen in the car, and he's very much, you know, like the speech you were just discussing. And then he talks to the psychologist at the end, and he's very adamant that, I, you know what, I'm not going to do it. i got to do my job, yada, yada, yada. But then you see him in the mirror looking at himself. He's taking pills. Uh, Keen mentions earlier, you know, when she going back to that car, that she has a degree and therefore she recommends that he does need to talk to someone. I think there's there's more coming from this incident. I think we're gonna get we're gonna get more out of wrestler. I think um, there's more coming for his character that he doesn't want to talk about yet or isn't hasn't been brought to the surface yet, but it's there. And is he talking about it with Liz? Because again, he was concerned about Liz in the car. You know, you got to stop moving around, going from place to place. You really need to settle down. Things are okay. You know, so it's almost like they're kind of looking out for each other. Is that a brother-sister relationship? Or like we alluded to on the last episode, are we actually going to see something bud between the two of them? Oh, no, they're going to make out. I'm calling it right now. They're not Luke and Leia. They're going to make out. Yeah. Even Luke and Leia made out once. See? Maybe it's going to be one of those twisted relationships. But they're definitely, they're definitely trying to have a relationship there. For this episode, though, I think it was really about his psychology. It seemed like there's a lot of psychology going on in this episode, and I definitely don't want to let that slip because I really think going forward, Wrestler and his emotional state is going to come back into play several times. You know, he did lose his fiance in a graphic way, and it's really because of this task work, task force. It's everything that he's doing. So at some point, the weight of that is going to pull at him. And I'd like that you mentioned that psychology was the theme in this episode because you had that whole aspect with Harold. And then if you think about what Berlin and Red are doing to each other, 
that is also a psychological play. It's who can one up the other with some kind of smart antic or smart witty comeback. And they're literally just playing mind games with each other when neither one of them probably has what is the truth at the end of the day, which may be holding with Mr. Fitch and company. Oh, everything. And, and I really like that the episode addressed that because I think too often in fictional television, the, the consequences or the repercussions are kind of left on the table and they just keep going forward with a new twist or the new, you know, the new element of the day, whatever that, that element may be, the plot twist or, or what have you, or new character growth. This one, there's real repercussions. Each character is really dealing with the events from the previous season, and I like that. I like that they they added that little layer to it. It kind of takes it up a level from just being your basic, you know, spy type uh, show to being something a little bit more dramatic and a little deeper. For me personally, so the hooded figure is stalking Keen, keeps popping up everywhere. You know, you got Dr. Death in the car just sitting there with a sniper rifle, checking out Keen. It's a little creepy. Do you think it's Tom? I'm absolutely positive it's Tom. The question is, is how long will that play out before Tom comes out of the shadows? Do you think it's Tom because the cameraman zoomed in <laughs> on his glasses? or? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, the glasses were the dead giveaway. It was like, Keep it a little mysterious, at least for an episode or two, then zoom in for the glasses on like maybe three or four. Yeah, that was actually, for an episode I really, I really like, I thought this was a great episode, sincerely. But that was one of those moments where you're watching it going, really? We had to do that already? Well, I think there was maybe some pushback or fallout from Comic-Con when they were like, Tom's not going to be in the first eight if you will, they're not going to focus on Tom. And people are like, well, well wait, the, that was the big cliffhanger was what happened to Tom at the end. So here they're showing you, hey, Tom's in play. Don't worry about it. We got it under control. So why do you think they didn't just show Tom? They had they don't want to pay him yet? I think they wanted to keep this suspense thing going with Lizzie and being concerned. And, you know, she was like, oh, my gosh, they're not looking for Red because they have this subscription to Cat Fancy or whatever it was, mm -hmm. uh, the magazine. <laughs> so, you know, is, is Baltimore looking for me? Is Baltimore looking for Aram? Is Baltimore looking for Wrestler? You know, we don't know who Baltimore is really looking for. And I think just if they showed Tom right away, it would take from that suspense of there is somebody tailing her. There is somebody watching her. And because of that, that's why she has to keep moving. And that's why she has to have the Justin Bieber look when she talks to red. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. I definitely want to talk about that when we get there. Cause that hoodie. Okay. So the question with the Tom, alleged Tom, we don't know for sure. We've only seen glasses. We haven't seen his face. You know, just like in police lineups, you have to actually see the face. Do you think he's keeping an eye on her or is he just watching her to see exactly what her connection to Red is or is he protecting her? That's a really good question. I would say if there is, you can't be with a person that long and not have feelings. I think we said this on a previous episode. So I'm sure he's keeping tabs on her, maybe not so much from a Berlin situation anymore because that's out in the open and everything, but maybe he's keeping tabs on her just because of what Reddington is capable of. Mm. And so he wants to be there to be the hero if the hero card is needed. Because he did allude, or he didn't allude, he said flat out, that you don't know who Red is really. And that was your theory, right? That's been your theory all along that Tom is actually not so bad that we have, he's misunderstood. Even though he kills people in cold blood. Mm -hmm. It happens. Things happen. What are you going to do? All right, Cooper. Now we talked about uh, Cooper. Harry Lennox has, his character was a little bland last year. I think we both agreed on that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, really not, Anything of interest, one episode with the judge where we learn a little bit about this Kuwait incident. Mm -hmm. And right here out of the gate, boom, Kuwait is back on the table. So must not be so little that they're willing to put it in the season premiere. And this is, for me personally, the most interesting Cooper has been the whole series. Maybe it's, maybe it's the stubble. That could be it, the, the little beard going on. I'm so glad you said something about that because I looked at him, I was like, is that really him? Because he doesn't look anything like Harry Lennox that I know. This guy looks totally different. No, he looks yeah, this, cooler. Really? He totally looks cooler. He looks yeah. Lawrence Fishburne-like. <laughs> I think he's more handsome than Lawrence Fishburne, but I get what you're saying. 
He's got the stubble. He's got a little bit of, yeah, I want to call it, you know, weight to him, but he had, he filled out a little bit and he's got the limp with the cane. You know, he actually, there was more to his character in the little bit he was on the screen tonight than there was in the entire first season. I agree. And that was our one, our one complaint was for this character, if you're going to bring him back, cause we didn't know at the time, you know, when we did our, our first two episodes, we didn't know if they were going to bring Cooper back. Cause we've been trying to avoid any spoilers or as many as we could. So we could go into this fresh. So we thought he would be in the first episode, but we didn't know what that meant. But now that he's coming back, our one concern was just don't bring him back and make him the same because he wasn't layered. He wasn't interesting. He was really just the FBI guy. He was just that FBI guy who gives orders and, and says, oh, no, we got to trust Red and, you know, things like that. Here they actually gave him a little bit more depth. They gave him the Kuwait incident, which he had before, but we really got a little bit more of it. Red offers him essentially freedom from whatever happened in Kuwait. You any theories yet to what happened? No idea on what happened, but if you're going to buy that that was Red's only copy of the incident or whatever happened in Kuwait, I call foul. There's no way Red's going to give up his only copy. He's not that kind of guy. I don't know. I, I think he genuinely likes him. Respects him, maybe. You don't agree? Well, sure, because he gives him that little, like, bro love tap as he kind of walks out the door <laughs> at the end of the conversation. So there's there's obviously a bond between these two. They went through the Naval Academy together. That was the backstory we were given for this show, is that they were friends and comrades, if you will, at one time. And I think that Red, like Sam, you know, there's certain limits. There's, I will take care of you as long as you take care of me. But damn, if you cross me, you're screwed then. He also alluded to his diagnosis, which they didn't say what that diagnosis was. But the implication is that he has a short life on this planet. Would you agree? Absolutely. I think that there was something major that was found, whether it was cancer, leukemia, Lou Gehrig's something, I don't know. But the real question was, was did he actually buy that information from Lord Baltimore? That's a good point. I just assume maybe he bribed someone at the hospital. You think he got it from Lord Baltimore? Well, or at least he got it from Apple because it was in health kit with uh, <laughs> the iOS 8 download or something that he had on his phone because he's just been sitting in his house all day moping around. <laughs> That's possible. He put it in the cloud and you know how easy it is to hack that. Well, it's interesting to see at the end of the episode, we've got Cooper back in charge. So it's nice to see his character really get some, some depth. And now we've got a little bit more investment in the character. For me personally, I assume you as well. Is Cooper back in charge? That's the question. Sure seemed like it. Why do we get introduced to the deputy attorney general then? Uh, I think just because they had to show that Cooper went back of his own volition. No? Okay. That's what I'm taking away from it. And then if he is back, what about the other guy, the guy that was riding, you know, the back of Harold last season? Is he still around or is he out of the picture? And now this new deputy attorney general becomes the new Diane in the way that the task force is run. I don't know. That's a good question. That's one of those things where we're going to see going forward. But I think at this point, Cooper's the man and you might see some uh, multitude of puppets behind the scenes, but I think Cooper's the guy. What about Mossad? Okay, that's a, a new character. When they had this this pretty cool Mission Impossible style extraction with uh, you know, Black Hawk Down and everything else going on in that in that office building. <laughs> that took me by surprise because I didn't see that happening in an episode of The Blacklist. Yeah, because it was oh, okay, is it US government? Is it NSA? You know, this is a really well put together operation. So then you're thinking MI six possibly. Mm -hmm. Um and when it comes down to it, here we find out that it has to do with Israel's secret service called Mossad. And if you're a Covert Affairs fan, you're very familiar with the Mossad group and what it's capable of. Well, why don't you explain it? Because I'm not a Covert Affairs, and I assume it's the same group. So explain. The CIA exists in the United States, and MI6 exists in, in, in Britain. And so Mossad would be the equivalent of a CIA for Israel. Okay. All right. Keep, keep Continue your thought. Well, what I really loved about the scene, there was two things. Number one, I love how Red's like, oh, Lord Baltimore. And then she talks and then Red's like, crap, I was so wrong on that one. You're actually something else. And then he immediately goes into, oh, you're pissed off about this incident that I just happened to pull from the back of my memory banks and just brought it right up right here. And that's why you captured me. So we have these 
interesting little stories that get creeped up in the middle of the other parts of the story. So it's like this, you know, C story inside of the B story kind of thing that we talked about. And I'm sure that this one little tiny incident, even though it seemed very insignificant for this episode, will actually come back into play either sometime in season two later on or potentially three or four down the line. But the thing that I really loved was the fact that you could actually make a GPS tracking device out of the dye color in your tie. I thought that was totally awesome. Yeah, I didn't know you could do any of that. <laughs> Learning new things all the time. This show is really just a fountain of knowledge. You have to be careful where you buy your clothes from now because you never know who's going to be watching you through your phone and watching you through your outerwear. Thanks for freaking me out. Completely freaking me out. I appreciate it. Like I wasn't already worried that the man is constantly following me. <laughs> well, then the question is, is someone tracking the hood strings that are both on Mr. Glasses in the car? And then, of course, you have the hood that uh, Liz is wearing later on. Are there some tracking devices in her hood strings as well? So answer this question for me because, honestly, this is a part where – and I've seen the episode twice and I'm still a little gray on it. Ultimately, why did they take in to begin with? I'm assuming for retribution and atonement for whatever this incident was that happened, the real question is, is why did she call – the U.S. government to say, hey, I captured this guy, because then Red says, the guy you just called, he's going to come spring me free in like 20 minutes. Exactly. That, that was the part that was kind of weird to me. It's like, why wouldn't you take him back to your people? Why would you turn him into the U.S. government? Well, that to me, that's why I'm so confused, because to me, that says that the, he knew that the government was also involved in the kidnapping. So it isn't just that they took him, because obviously they're not going to call the U.S. government for no reason and say, hey, we just kidnapped, you know, an informant. They kidnapped him and then called the government for a specific reason, and that's the reason I was hoping you could clear up because I didn't catch anything else on it. The only thing that I can think of is that she's operating under a certain protocol, calls the government to turn him in to a certain group inside of the U.S. government, but at the end of the day, part of this Mr. Fitch group has somebody over Mossad, has somebody over the U.S. government, and then they push down from above to say, hey, yeah, don't worry about it, we got this taken care of. And then that's how they get him extradited and freed from the Mossad stranglehold. Okay. I guess we're going to find out. I, I was really confused. That's the one part of the episode where I'm like, uh-huh. And I actually had to rewind it a couple times and watch it again. Because I thought maybe there was, in that dialogue between the two of them, maybe there was something that I missed. But they really don't explain it. So it's, it's another, this whole episode is full of uh, what I like to refer to as the babysitter ad. Which is, you know, when you go to a bulletin board on like a college campus and they have like babysitter needed and then they have all the, the dangling <laughs> dangling tags at the bottom. That's what this episode feels like because it's, it's full of dangling tags just with different phone numbers. So, Which I think is needed when you're doing a season premiere to set up what those storylines might be for the course of the season. Absolutely. And I think it did a great job because, I mean, there are so many threads dangling. You can make a blanket before this season's over. Now, Naomi Highland... Now, we've heard Mary Louise Parker was going to be in the episode. We had an idea of what character she was going to play. But now we absolutely 100% know that Naomi Highland was Red's wife. Tell me what you thought of this character introduction. I thought the character introduction overall was great. I thought the first thing that went through my mind was, okay, so Red was married. His wife is still alive. Now, Naomi said that she took her daughter to Philadelphia, so the daughter is alive. The question then becomes, is the daughter Red's daughter? Because we know Red had a daughter because he does this ballet thing where he goes every year and mm -hmm. watches Swan Lake and all that jazz. So is this daughter that went to Philadelphia with Naomi Red's daughter or not? And then the question becomes, if his family was brutally killed on Christmas Eve, and that story holds true, is this a second wife, a third wife, a fourth wife? Who knows? Uh, I think I think it's his one and only. I think he obviously still has an affinity for her, an affection for her, and Berlin was definitely counting on that. So obviously other people are aware of this. She has taken her life underground. Um, I think he feels horrible for the pain that he's caused her. You don't feel that guilt unless it's somebody that you truly loved. So I, I definitely think she's the quote-unquote one. Now, is there more to it? We'll find that out. But I definitely think she's the one. I don't think that's, you know, wife five in a 
you know, harem of Reds. I just, I think she's the one, and he probably was so traumatized he hasn't married after that. Yeah, but he does have occasional trysts here and there, Madeline Pratt and all of that jazz. So could he have potentially had a wife before his second wife? Because she said she had left him, right? Mm-hmm. You know, it was, it was just a pain to be part of Reddington's life. So could this have been his first wife? And it's his second wife and that family that was brutally murdered on Christmas Eve. Uh, I She mentioned the daughter. Didn't she say that Red killed our daughter? Uh, you know, I don't remember. I'd have to watch it again, right? That's why third time, fourth time, Netflix is there. That's there you what it's go. I, I could have swore she said that. Now, if I'm mistaken, I'm sure the audience will fill us in, but I could have sworn she did. You know, it's it's always hard. There's so much dialogue and so much to keep up with. So you guys let us know. That's the one thing I, I love about having people listening to the show is they can tell us when we when we miss something or if there's something we need to be reminded of. Yeah, if she did say that, though, maybe it's like you were saying, where it's the daughter's dead in her mind. She assumes that the daughter's dead, but maybe the daughter was also put into some kind of protective custody. And to her, the daughter's dead, but the daughter could be alive. No, there's definitely that possibility. Well, you're really twisting it around, aren't you? But she, the one thing I definitely 100% remember her saying is how her life was upended. Uh, you know, Wednesday is normal and Thursday everything's gone to crap. Her husband is a, you know, wanted man. Her life is ruined. I was really, I was really touched by, well, Mary Louise Parker, I think is a good actor. She's a very good actor. She's been a lot of stuff. Uh, I know a lot of people just know her from weeds, but she did a lot of stuff before that. Fried, fried green tomatoes. You ever see that? I, she was fantastic in that. Great in that movie. Mm-hmm. She's just a, she's just a very talented actress. I, I really liked her performance and I really liked that she gave some, some warmth and also a sensibility to us as an audience that, you know, you guys all think Red is so cool, but you're not seeing all the people he keeps destroying. You know what I mean? I really like that little touch of it that, tr- like throughout the episode, they, they, subtly reminded you guess what red is not just a cool guy he's also a jerk yeah totally i mean look at a wrestler right because of red his fiance is killed and his fiance left him in the first place because of red so mm-hmm. he's destroyed wrestler's life he's destroyed liz liz's life by killing her stepfather uh he's destroyed berlin's daughter's life apparently according to berlin we don't know for sure but basically anything red touches is toxic including his ex-wife. It, it was nice to have that, and I thought that was a very nice touch. Very good performance. Uh, performances throughout the episode. I thought everybody was right on right on task this week. You keep talking, though, like she's going to be gone from the show. I, I can't imagine they would bring in Mary Louise Parker and have her do this one bit and be done. So I, I think she's going to be back later on in the show, and that Berlin is not actually cutting her up piece by piece. And that it's literally he's sending somebody else's body parts over. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's her finger initially, you know, because you can cut off one finger and still live. But how many pieces can he send to Red before Red's just like, oh, she's dead anyway. Why the hell do I care? Oh, I agree with you. I think she's going to be here throughout the season. You, you don't bring an actress of her caliber in for one episode. She's going to be there. Uh, I, I was only speaking to this particular episode i definitely think she'll be here throughout the throughout the season and i agree with you i don't think that was her finger i don't know where the finger came from but i do want to know what was the deal with the polaroid picture okay so this is my theory you remember that he has the locket with the picture in it and then red has the same picture from the stewmaker's photo album okay i always thought that that girl in the picture was laying on a mattress and when he makes her lay down and kind of tilts her head to the side, the first thing that went into my mind was, okay, the girl in the picture has to be Berlin's daughter. And then he's basically recreating that picture for Red by taking this exact same Polaroid, but replacing it with his wife. Oh, I like it. I like it. That could work. That could definitely work. The only problem with the theory, though... Why are you introducing theories that you're just going to shoot down? Well, because there's still this open question of this picture in the book All from right. the Stewmaker episode. Because if he has the picture, the assumption is that she would have been a toxic bath, in which case there are no pieces to send to Berlin. Because if it was piece by piece, there would be no pieces if she actually did die in a bath by the Stewmaker, which then leads you to think, okay, well, maybe they were just jerking around with Berlin 
and not actually sending pieces of his daughter. They were just sending pieces of anybody because how could he get him tested or checked out because he's in a Russian prison? Interesting. I like it. You got a lot of theories. You don't want anybody to die either. I realize that. You, <laughs> all your theories are everybody's still alive somewhere. Uh, we found out that this one was in witness protection custody. We assumed she was dead last year. That's true. And boom, she's yeah. alive now. So now the alive train is off and running. Fine, fine. You're right. Everybody lives. <laughs> the end of the series, we're just going to see that everybody's still alive. Uh, Dembe returned. I mean, it was only, what, 15 minutes in we got our first Dembe sighting? What'd you think? Uh, Dembe was great this week, and he spoke. He did. He did. I, no, I, I love him. He's so good. I mean, there's just so much he can do. And the best part was right at the end of the episode when he goes to the door and gets the package and he's like, Red, you want me to open that for you? The first thing I thought of was like, man, that's awesome. He is such a you know devout follower of Reddington's that he's willing to open up that cyanide filled, anthrax filled envelope and take the hit for his buddy. I just loved it. I, I, I like him as an actor and I like and I'm, I can't pronounce his name, so I'm not even going to try because I know I'll butcher it and he's too good an actor to do that to him. But but. Uh, he does such a good job because every episode he doesn't really speak. So this is the first time he's really, you know, had a whole lot of dialogue. And anytime you get somebody that creates that presence without having the dialogue to, to really go with it, that to me says this is a guy you need to do more with because he's got – he has a presence that automatically has charisma. And and I love that about his him as an actor and him as a character. He's that guy where you just want to see more of him because he's that cool. The gravitas is so good. Yeah, and when he just kind of has that scene where he rolls over after Mossad kidnaps Red and the fedora is just sitting there on the ground and kind of looks at it, he's like, oh, man, dude, my boss is gone. <laughs> just that look on his face. He says so much without saying anything at all. So, so good. And that little moment when they, uh, they're they both going in guns blazing and I got that little Riggs and Murtaugh moment from Lethal Weapon. <laughs> That's my fav- my favorite moment of the episode. I actually did a fist pump. I'm like, oh my god, it's so cool. Yeah, I'd like to see actually more of that. You know, like we we're talking about Red on the go, Red taking action first, and then have Dembe be that partner right behind him. Yeah, you don't really see Red aiming a gun or d- doing any of the actions. He's always either reacting or he's manipulating. So that to see him do so many actions in one episode, I was really impressed with with that choice. All right, now let's get to the big hitters. Let's let's. Take care of this episode with with the three most important characters of the episode. The first being Elizabeth Keene. We started with her definitely obsessed with the case because, I mean, she sits in her bed and she has apparently every aspect of the case taped to her ceiling, which seems like a lot of a lot of headache for her. And of course, she's in her bra and panties. <laughs> what did you think about this reintroduction of Keene? I was really shocked through the course of the episode on how they played out her kind of paranoia, if you will, with the moving around, and then to then focus on this case wall on her ceiling. You got to take that down every time you move and put it back up in exactly the same manner. And maybe that's the motive. Maybe that's the play, right? Every time she takes it down and puts it back up, she finds another clue. So I could kind of go with that. But that just seemed like a lot of effort. And then, of course, you know, eating out of styrofoam, that's never fun. You know, at least get a nice plastic TV tray or something that you can do. Uh, and then... As she's doing that, she's filling out these papers, which I assumed at first were divorce papers. I never knew that you could actually get an annulment. I thought an annulment was something that was only done like through the church, not actually through the government, because I thought it was just straight divorce from the government. So I thought that was really interesting to see this annulment. And then, of course, she's like, well, he was never really my husband, so I never really had his name. So because that's not his name. And she keeps Keen as her last name. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. And I... I Okay, I don't think you can annul after you've been married for several years. I think, you know, there, there are stipulations. You can't, you know, have coitus and there's other aspects that you can't do and it has to be within a certain time frame. I'm sure they made some kind of allowance just because of the fact that, okay, you married an obvious terrorist. So we'll let you slide because you work for the government. That looks bad for us. Why do you think she wanted to keep the name? I think it was just because she's known as Elizabeth Keene on the show from all of season one. So the writers <laughs> have to keep it that way. Well, you don't think there's a bigger reason to it? Like maybe she did love Tom and did love parts of that life and she's just sorry that it came to an end? You know, I honestly do not know. It is so weird because even Tom's brother wasn't Tom's brother because Tom had a different brother from that episode where the guy jumps out of the hotel room. 
Mm-hmm. So even if she's involved with Tom's family, how much of Tom's mom, dad, sisters, aunts, uncles, whatever, are actually real people? So why keep the name? Yeah, that's the only part I don't get other than it's the, we have to keep it keen because that's what we called her when we started the show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm really curious exactly how that's going to... Uh, it's gonna factor, but it was definitely curious because as soon as she said it, I was I I did the uh, you know like a dog that just heard a noise, huh? You know I made that face. That's the huh? Maybe Tom and I will get back together because we do have feelings for each other because there's still that lingering. What did Tom tell Liz as he was slumping down in Fake Berlin's apartment? Uh, absolutely, and I gotta tell you. Apparently, Keen is not very good at this moving around thing because she's doing all this extra stuff to keep herself on the go and hidden. Meanwhile, you know, even just uh, dressing like Justin Bieber <laughs> with that that hoodie, you know, that's that's not really fooling anybody. And still, she gets followed by, you know, possible Tom. Well, and she's sitting there checking her Facebook on one of those phablet things. So anybody could read what she's doing from over his shoulder, not to mention all the, the big data bad guys like Lord Baltimore who are pulling it out of her uh, account. Oh, what about the hair? She cut her hair. I expected that to be coming. I mean, there were a lot of people that were ripping on the costume department for Megan Boone's wig in the first season. So the fact that we could get her a nice clean cut and get rid of the wig gate, I think that's a a good move. And it shows that she's got a fresh start. You hate to say that compared to the Felicity moment, but that's why Felicity cut her hair in Felicity. It was it was the fresh start. It's the new moment. It's the new me. So it's kind of that symbolic moving on aspect, especially when you take into account the awesome song that was playing throughout the course of that section. I, I was very happy that we got to see Megan Boone smile. She she's has a beautiful smile, and they, they don't do it enough on the show. So it was nice that, she came out, even though it was a little close to a Calgon commercial, you know, when <laughs> when she comes bouncing out of the elevator. Uh, it was a little bit too, uh, you know, or, or whatever those shampoo commercials were. I'm just like, okay, downplay that a little bit. <laughs> that was a little over the top. But then Harold comes walking out too, and everybody's excited. So then everybody kind of has a smile on their face, except for, of course, Wrestler, mm-hmm. which I think is going to be a big part of season two. Yeah, because he's all psychologically messed up. That's Oh, it's coming. Now, do you think Keen got enough time on the show this episode? I thought so. I thought that there was a, a good part where she was kind of like in charge, kind of leading wrestler where wrestler needed to go, and then wrestler got some stuff, and then Aram got some stuff. Number one, I say the blacklist was about Reddington, number one. So if you had an episode that was, say, 80% Reddington, 20% everybody else, I think it'd still be a fine blacklist episode. You know, do you need Elizabeth Keene to be as important in season two as she was in season one? Now that we know that every single person on the blacklist, at least thus far, was to get to Berlin. And do you need Liz to accomplish that now that Berlin is in play? I don't know. Well, I still think she's a very good actor. And Oh, yeah, absolutely. Everybody on the show is. Yeah. And the one thing, my only complaint for the whole episode, and it's going to sound weird because I'm a guy. But I wasn't a fan of the whole she's bouncing around her bra and panties just because I don't like when you sexualize characters like that. Because, you know, every time you do that, to me, it takes it down a notch. You know, you've got a strong, independent woman. And then, of course, we have to show the obligatory she's in her bra and panties. I don't need to see that. That's the one thing. She's a beautiful woman. I don't need proof of that. So keep her in character. I just didn't I didn't think that fit. And it kind of took me out of the moment, if that makes sense. Well, and I thought it was going to be in context because there's a difference when it's shown in context. Mm -hmm. If she's truly suffering, uh, the name of the song was Divisionary, Do the Right Thing from Ages to Ages. And the line in there was, don't you know you're not the only one suffering? And if she's suffering at this point, maybe she has a vice and she was in that hotel room with a guy. Mm -hmm. You know, then it makes sense, which is where I thought it was going when it was starting out. And then you find out that this is just her place. Then I'm like, oh, yeah, then that doesn't make sense. Just cut it out. You don't need it. Put on a robe. It dilutes the character, and she's too good an actor for that. You don't need it. Personal opinion. Now, what about Berlin? Berlin, and we're get, we're coming to everybody's favorite character. You know, hold on. <laughs> but Berlin, you know, we've got Peter Stormare, who I'm a big fan of because I'm a big Prison Break fan. And this poor guy is the creepy guy in every single thing <laughs> he does. I almost feel bad for him. I was even watching an episode of Longmire a couple weeks back. Bring back Longmire. I love that show. And he's in that He's in there for one or two episodes. He's a bad guy in that. It's like, can this guy not get a job where he's not the creepy guy? 
I don't mind the creepy guy. I think it's awesome when you have a guy. I believe it was Marcus, wasn't it, that actually came into his room, or was it the other guy that came in when Berlin was sitting? Why is he sitting in an ice bath? Number one, that was my first question of the evening. Because he's creepy. That's what creepy guys do. They bathe in ice. (laughs) Yeah. So he comes walking in. He's like, "Oh, you know, it's going to cost more money." And the first thing Berlin does is grabs him and dunks him into the ice water. So number one, you're dunked into the ice water in a bath. Number two, you're dunked into an ice water bath with one of the world's biggest serial killers in Berlin or bad guys, whatever you want to call them. And number three, the dude's naked. Come on. (laughs) Really? All the other stuff I didn't care about. The naked part, that's where you had me. I'm like, okay, that's wrong. Totally wrong. What did you think about his master plan about using Lord Baltimore to get to the wife, to kidnap her, and then take this creepy Polaroid and then potentially cut her finger off? We're still not convinced the finger's gone. Until you show me a a nub, I don't believe it either. But how did you feel that they handled the reintroduction of Berlin? I think it's the same MO, right? Because he had Jolene and Tom working to get to Liz because Liz with his, was his one vice in order to get to Red, which paid off. So now his next vice to get Red out of the shadows is to go for the next person that's important to him, which is his ex-wife. So at least the MO is consistent. Mm-hmm. And I think that really makes you say, okay, this is a cohesive story from season one to season two. I will say, yes, he does do a fantastic bad guy. I mean, it's just his nature. I just kind of feel bad. I always feel bad for actors that are definitely typecast in a certain role because I always feel like the poor guy's going to walk on the street or he's getting some, you know, some eggs at the grocery store and some woman just comes up and just starts hitting him. That's what I picture. Oh, see, now if I saw Peter at the grocery store getting some eggs and I was getting some milk, I would drop my milk cartons, splattered all over the floor and run away. <laughs> or there's that reaction. I feel bad for the guy. He's just creeping people out everywhere he goes. Oh, wow. Okay, now we're finally at everybody's favorite character, Raymond Red Reddington. His return was great. His dialogue was, was top-notch. The kidnapping was cool. And when he got out, he was he was already, he was Billy Badass. Does he get all the cool plots to the show? I would expect him to get all the cool plots to the show. And if he's not getting the cool plots, then he's at least dictating the pieces on the chessboard to make the cool plot happen. I mean, it is Reddington's show. I mean, it was his blacklist. It's his people, his contacts. He set up this network. He knows the players. So an episode without Reddington actually probably wouldn't go over as well. Although I do have to give credit this evening because I really like the interaction between Aram and Wrestler and Liz and kind of their little kind of Scooby gang, if you will, doing their own thing because the show could potentially go without Red. I know I'm going to get shot for saying that, but it really set itself apart this evening that you could have a less red episode and still have the show make sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That that was the one thing that I would say is the strongest point of the of the season two premiere because throughout last season, okay, whenever I watch an episode, th- there are t- there's two factors. Either the storyline was ingrained in Red's story so much that even when he wasn't there, you're still thinking about Red. Or it had those moments where Red wasn't anywhere to be found and you were a little bored. You know, the, that happens in shows where you've got a character that's so strong, you know, like such a prominent figure, you know, he just leaves that mark. And I think they did a very good job of making, of really elevating the characters that are currently on the show, making them more interesting. Wrestler's more interesting. You've got Cooper's more interesting. Keen, Keen was already interesting, but her storyline just keeps getting deeper and deeper. You know, even, um, what's the computer guy? Um, uh, Rom. Even Rom had an interesting little tiny arc. So, I mean, for me, this is the, the best evidence that the show can sustain long periods of Red's absence. And also, so he doesn't have to be in this giant security block, you know, at, at FBI headquarters or whatever, at the task force headquarters, just to make the show work. And that, that was extremely important, I think, for this premiere. Now, the one thing we didn't talk about yet through our discussion is the opening sequence where he's actually down in Cameroon and he's talking to Yubari, this kind of dictator, if you will. And granted, great opening, the Hellfire missiles, all that stuff was awesome. Mm -hmm. The thing that I really keyed in on was the fact that Yubari told Red, if you're ever in my country again, I'm going to kill you. So again, it's one of these little dangling babysitter ad chads on the piece of paper of, okay, well, why was Red in Cameroon before, and why does this guy want to kill him? And now we have a whole other piece of the story and a piece of the puzzle we can explore. Uh, that's that's a good point. I don't know. There's already too many questions. If I, 
<laughs> Every time I start answering one, I get three more. I, I really don't know. But yeah, it was it was a nice little touch. I really like the Hellfire missiles, by the way. And I I especially liked that you showed throughout the episode that Red was determined to try to find Berlin before he found what he was looking for. And once we found out exactly what it, you know, that he was looking for Naomi the whole time, you know, you see that element of Red having compassion. Um, he obviously cares about this woman. This woman means a lot to him. This is very personal for him. There's obviously a war coming, but, you know, it's just he had so many facets to his personality this episode. I just I thought uh, James Spader just knocked it out of the park like he always does. I mean, he really never brings brings it short. So, well, with Reddington, the big thing that we like about him the most on the blacklist is his great lines. And what we're going to do on the blacklist exposed is try to find two lines each week that we really enjoyed the most. And then we're going to play them for you here on the podcast and have you guys vote on them in a segment we like to call Red's Rhetoric. Now, this week during the blacklist, we had two standout lines from Raymond Red Reddington himself. The first line tonight was during the opening sequence with Yubari in the negotiations down in Cameroon. Typically, I steer clear of tin pot dictators who employ boy soldiers, but I'm afraid this situation is unique. Shakuti. Well, now you're being short-sighted. Pardon. A man calling himself Berlin hired a bounty hunter to find me and my associates. That bounty worked for you. I've since dispatched of him, but if Berlin hired one bounty hunter, he hired five. I want their names. I'm willing to pay three million. We really should act swiftly. We really should kill you and keep your money. Now, there's a point of view that I can relate to. <laughs> Yabari, look at me. Give me what I want, or so help me God, I'll make it rain fire on you. The second line tonight was when he was talking to the lady from Mossad. Lord Baltimore, aren't you a surprisingly saucy minx? Bless me, Paul. Unbelievable. I'm sorry, who is it exactly that you think I am? You're Mossad. Please don't tell me this is about that little dust-up in Haifa. That dust-up claimed the lives of two agents and a Turkish diplomat. <laughs> a diplomat? I had nothing to do with it. Then you have nothing to worry about. Oh, you have no idea how I wish that were true. I have tens of thousands of things to worry about. Fortunately, you, my dear, are not one of them. And why is that? Because the person you just informed of my capture is going to release me within the hour. Aren't we confident today? I'm confident every day. I thought we had nothing in common. Which liner do you think was better? Let us know by tweeting us your vote at the Blacklist GSM with your vote. That is vote number one if you like the line, you're being short-sighted. Or vote number two if you like, I'm confident every day. If you like either one of those lines, send us a note. Again, tweet us at the Blacklist GSM. All right, now let's go to special agent intel. Any uh, emails or, or feedback that we get from you guys? And obviously, this is our first full episode, so we expect to be hearing more from you as as we go on. But this is from Todd in Illinois. Hi, podcast crew. Todd here to send in my feedback for this week's episode of Blacklist. I give Lord Baltimore eight ballistic missiles. <laughs> is that out of ten, Todd, or how many? How many? You get, how many are you packing? It's out of eight. <laughs> That's out of eight. Uh, number one, you have no idea how good it feels to be here today. Thank you so much for doing a podcast on one of my favorite shows of all time. I started watching the show for fun, but the stories and the characters became so deep and engaging that I wished uh, GSM had picked it up to podcast on. Well, guess what? We did. Number two, Netflix, Amazon. This episode had more pop culture references than the entire first season. That yeah. was not a pop culture reference. That was a complete shout out to say Netflix paid $2 million an episode for this content. <laughs> And no, not Amazon. Yep, that's exactly what that was. That was um, some clever product placement, if you will. But yeah, I get what you're saying. Number three, why was I not surprised when the girl turned out to be Lord Baltimore or that Lord Baltimore turned out to be a girl? Well, those are two questions, Todd. What, what do you think there? Well, 
at first I was like, okay, it's going to be a girl because they showed us the clip of the Mossad agent. And she's like, oh, Lord Baltimore, you're different than I expected. And so I thought it was going to be a female all along. And then when it turned out to be the other person, I was, oh, that's a, that's an interesting twist. Didn't see that coming. So yeah, I agree. Did not see it coming at all. Here's one thing I will tell you about Blacklist. Never second guess them or, or never doubt them because they so far have not seemed too worried about making a female uh, uh, a villain or a character of, of extreme depth. You know, a lot of shows like this, you'll have the female heroine and that's all the females you're going to see in the show. Everybody else is a bunch of brooding men. This one doesn't seem to, it doesn't seem to shy away from that. So I, I really commend them on that. And we talked about that in our episode zero, mm-hmm. our introduction review of season one about John Bokenkamp and the fact that he is a very female centric lead kind of character writer in most of the stuff that he does. So don't be surprised if we don't see more females on the blacklist as we go along. That's right. There's a lot of gender equality in the crime world. Number four, if they didn't bring Cooper back to the task force in the premiere, I'd stop watching the show altogether. Wow. He loves Cooper. I think he's going to love Cooper even more this season. I think we're going to get a lot more out of him, and it was more of a downplay for season one, so that season two would seem super epic with his character. I already love Cooper more than I did last season, and it's been one episode. It's not, it's not hard. And five, uh, last but not least, what do you think the diagnosis is? Terminal cancer, maybe? They are already setting up his inevitable write-off. I don't know. I mean, cancer, you can... I think they're going to have some emotional moments, but whatever his illness is, I think he can drag on for a couple of years, yeah? Well, remember, you had that Frederick Barnes episode where his son had uh, supposedly uncurable illness. He does the wrong way to find the cure and does actually find the cure. So even if he has some critical diagnosis, it's not one to say that there couldn't be a way to save his life. Exactly. Maybe they can find a Rambaldi. Oh, wait, sorry, wrong show. Um, (laughs) (laughs) That's all for now. Until next time, this is Todd in Illinois, where I'm not on the blacklist yet. I like that. He has his own little, own little tagline. Thanks so much, Tom, for sending that. And remember, if you have intel you want to share with us, just visit goldenspiralmedia.com slash feedback to submit your intel right here into the agency. And I think that is great for our first one right out of the gate. So hopefully we'll be getting some more as the show progresses. Absolutely. I, I really appreciate it. Definitely keep those coming in. That's what we want to hear. We want to hear from you guys. We've talked for an hour about the premiere which is longer than the actual premiere, which for me says we want feedback from you guys. So be sure to do that. That's going to conclude this episode. Be sure to follow us on Twitter this season at the Blacklist GSM. We're live tweeting during the East Coast Central um, time slot feed, which uh, we just did. Had a lot of fun with that. I, you know, uh, Dembe retweeted us. Christian Ritter favorited us. We're having a lot of fun. We're, we're trying to have a little bit of fun with the episode, not spoiling it, because I know some of you West Coast guys aren't going to catch it until a little later. So while we might make some jokes or some cracks, we're definitely not going to ruin any big events that happen throughout the episode. That's important to us. We also have a Facebook group, which you can join, which we just started. Uh, it's at facebook.com slash groups slash the Blacklist GSM. You can find that on Facebook. Join up. Any comments you want thrown in, you can definitely go there and, and message us there. And our new, our new website home will have all the episode intel and analysis at goldenspiralmedia.com slash the blacklist. Of course, if you are completely adverse to technology because you are afraid of Lord Baltimore, you can give us your thoughts the old-fashioned way by just giving us a call at plus one three zero four eight three seven two two seven eight. Again, that is plus one three zero four eight three seven two two seven eight. Or you can just record your own message via MP3 or record it right off of your smartphone or computer, just head on over to goldenspiralmedia.com slash the blacklist and use the feedback section on the left-hand side. And as you leave your feedback, be sure to mention the blacklist exposed and a big thank you for listening this week. Don't forget to answer our profiling question of the week. You guys ready? Is Berlin's daughter dead or did they make Berlin believe it to frame red? I think that is an excellent question because I think that's exactly what Berlin is doing to red in regards to his wife. I think she's still alive. I think she's still intact. And I think that they're just playing mind games with each other. So I still say Berlin's daughter is alive. And I still say that Berlin's daughter is Liz. Well, I'm not, I'm not sold on that yet. So I definitely want to hear what you guys think. Yeah, convince me, whatever your theory is, convince me because you already heard Troy's and I'm not, I'm not decided yet. So I want to hear from you guys. Is Berlin's daughter dead or did they make Berlin believe it to frame red? 
Or, you know, maybe you think Red just wants Berlin to believe she's dead for a reason. Very possible. Very possible indeed. Again, goldenspiralmedia.com slash the blacklist or goldenspiralmedia.com slash feedback. You can go to either place to submit your answer and we will see you next time. I am Agent Troy Heinrichs. That's at Troy Heinrichs if you want to follow me on Twitter personally. And of course, if you're a fan of Resurrection on ABC, you can check out my other show, Resurrection Revealed, over at resurrectionrevealed.com. And I'm Agent Aaron Peterson, and you can find me talking about movies and TV on the Hollywood Outsider podcast. That's available at thehollywoodoutsider.com. I'm also available on Twitter. Go to our tweet is uh, at H underscore Outsider. It's, it's really about everything movie, so definitely check that out. Be sure to come back next week, and we will talk about Monarch Douglas Bank. In the meantime, be sure to keep yourself off of The Blacklist. The Blacklist Exposed is a Golden Spiral Media production, copyright 2014. Find more of our great podcasts at goldenspiralmedia.com slash podcasts.